it's an interesting world where it's changing so quickly and the people that are at the forefront of it are really, really capitalizing on it at the moment. So yeah, if you can get in front, like yeah. you know, there's a wave that you can ride. Hey guys, welcome back to Ocean Feels. This is the YouTube version of the podcast, so by all means, welcome. This is the first video that I've posted on this channel for such a long time. I do plan on posting a whole bunch more videos, so if you do want to see those videos, please subscribe to see some more. But today we have Tom Nosk on the podcast. Uh, Tom is awesome. You're going to really enjoy this episode, so let's dive right in. Perfect. All right, here we are with Tom Nosk. How do you say your last name? It's Nosky. So Nosky. It's an interesting one. It's... Um, uh, I think I said, I think I mentioned it in a video recently. It's like, um, we thought it was German for a while because there's quite a famous fighter pilot for the German infantry that was, uh, he was named Noski. And there's a German rower as well who went to the 2000 games. She was a, a Noski as well. But then we found out that we immigrated back in the 1800s. So I think we were actually Prussian. Prussian or German? Prussian. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we, uh, home of origin doesn't even exist anymore, which is interesting. Well, it's, it's interesting and it's probably it's one of the reasons why I shortened my Instagram name to Mac because my, my full name is Mackay, mm. but most people read Mackay as McKay Mackie. and it can be McKay too, right? Mm. Um, but it's Mackay, even though there's a major city in Australia that's called Mackay and everyone doesn't yeah. get that wrong. <laughs> no, I, but, I, I thought it was Mackie for, for yeah. the longest time. So, I just I just run with Mac, plus it's just a little bit shorter and easier and... yeah. Well, maybe so, I should maybe I should think about shortening. What do you get? Nos? <laughs> Nos. Tom Nos. Well, I get Tom Nos, Nos rolls pretty well. I get well Nos Nosk anyway, so oh, people really? think the e is silent, so I end up getting Nosk anyway. Yeah. So and most so of the time, it's yeah, I get Tom Nosk. Because I think I heard, I'm not sure which podcast and they were talking about you and they were. I think it was the the no, it was the uh, it was Adam's podcast. It was the What the Focus podcast. Oh, okay. I think they introduced me as Tom Nosk or Tom Nosk no. or whatever. <laughs> it was it was it was odd and I was like, is that really how it is? No. So Nosky. <laughs> so, imagine it's got okay. a Y on the end of it. I'd imagine pronounced. you'd know your know your own name better than Yeah, that. you'd hope so at this point. Unless yeah. my parents have been lying to me my entire life, which would be interesting. <laughs> Same with mine. Maybe I'm just like adopted and it's funny, <laughs> right? Because see I don't look like a Mackay. A Mackay is a Scottish Right, so my background really? is Scottish, right? And so I don't look Scottish. Really? And this is the first time we're recording. You look like a combination of, <laughs> I would say, Thai and Islander. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's that's the thing. See, my background is, um, and when I used to travel, I would give people, I'd, I'd get, offer them 50 bucks if they could guess where, you're from. where my parents are from um, and where I was born. Can right? I get that deal? <laughs> Do you want to have a go? You, uh, you just did. Uh, I'll guess, I'll guess. Right. Um Oh, off the bat, Philippines. And? And. What did I say originally, Thai? And um, I'm this islander as well. So New Zealand? You got it right. Really? Uh, but but <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out like on that one because you're not 100% right because mm. my dad is actually not an islander. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a white guy. He's a, It's Funnily enough, he's born in New Zealand, but he's the only one in his whole family born in New Zealand. Really? And so his brothers and sisters born in Australia and England. And mm. so they came out on the two pound POM deal <laughs> way back in the day. Yeah. And then they were in Australia for a while and they moved to New Zealand. And most of my dad's family is still in New Zealand. Some mm. of them have moved back to Australia here. Um, but yeah, my mum's Filipino <laughs> and I was born here. No way. So yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that's where, you, yeah, it's like almost that Philippine mix gave you back the, the New Zealand <laughs> tradition. Yeah, that's it. And so, I don't know. It's been good. Like, I um, I call myself Mr. Worldwide. I'm a pure, <laughs> I'm a purebred mongrel. <laughs> Mr. So, Worldwide. Right, yeah. oh, Jesus. Tooting his own horn over here. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's because, like, when I'm in, um, so if I'm in, like, somewhere like South America, I can pass. Mm. If I'm in the Middle East, I can almost pass. Oh, that's fine. actually a good point. Yeah, you right. don't get considered a yeah. tourist anywhere you go. Yeah, so it's weird, right? When I'm in the Philippines especially, right, I'm yeah. I'm 100% considered an Australian in the Philippines, right? They don't really? look at me don't and think look I'm a local or you know, part of them at all. It's probably um, it's, it's probably the family dynamic and you yeah. know, you're, you're there with... And obviously if they hear my accent as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. It definitely doesn't help. I don't speak Tagalog very well, <laughs> in fact, at all. <laughs> no. And so... Um, but when I'm in Australia, especially growing up, I'd often be called the Filipino kid. 
mm. right? And so that's like that's their referral to me as the you know the Filipino kid. Mm. So it's weird. It's kind of a weird dynamic. I've always grown up being known as a Filipino kid here, but then when I'm when I go back to my mum's hometown, I'm the Australian kid, <laughs> and so it's like. Um, everyone. That's so funny. Everyone and no one. <laughs> that's so funny. I can't believe I got it. I can't believe I got it first I know, try. That's, that's, I think you, I would. I, th- I think there's only been one other person that's ever got that. <laughs> and you're only like... Yeah. I think it's... Uh, I don't know. You've done know. well. I have, so, I have family from everywhere as well. So it's a bit of the same. I've got... Uh, most of my family's from Australia, my main family, but through, you know, marriages and whatnot, I've got relatives in, in New Zealand and all over the place. So it's it's similar. Like I sort good. of I sort of get it. Oh, the, world's, the world's getting smaller, you know, everyone's... Oh, man, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's like, it's getting bigger and smaller at the same time. Yeah. It's like you see like something like social media and you, you know, you finish school and you, when you're at high school, it's like you've got your community of like 300 people. It's like, that's all you hang out with. That's all you see. That's all you hear. And then all of a sudden you get exposed to the real world and you do a little bit of traveling and suddenly you meet people and you're like, oh, these people have stories just like my 300 friends too. Yeah. Or my 300 people I know do. So it's, it's funny that the world's becoming smaller through social media, but also becoming bigger. It's like, think about like 50 years ago, like people wouldn't even consider people on the other side of the world to be even in the same you know yeah. idea it's like when you walk it's through like the an, street literally another world almost yeah. right it's like the thing that blows my mind the most is like when you walk through the street it's like every single person you meet is like they have a story just the same as you and it's just as important to you as yours is to them it's like it's this amazing thing that social media allows you to do where it's like you can really relate to people it's like yeah. it's like i met ben this morning yeah <laughs> it's like right. it's crazy yeah first so, time meeting this morning yeah so it's 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 a crazy world like an absolutely crazy world so okay and so <laughs> for those that so, so, i guess so for those that don't know who you are and mm-hmm. what you do give us your idea of like what you think or oh, how you perceive my job yourself description yeah what's your job description? <laughs> like? my job description is changing by the minute um i don't know i got this i got called the celestial photographer on a live stream i did the other day so i think i'm gonna stick with that the celestial photographer no i don't know i'm like a (laughs) i do like that though. yeah i'd like it a lot i want to put it in my instagram bio i wish i could remember the bloke who said it um no i i think it depends who you ask like i'm i'm a full-time freelance filmmaker that's how i make my money that's what i do um but as far as what you guys have probably seen if you're watching this um instagram wise i'm just a a photographer who likes to heavily manipulate his images. So a digital artist who takes his own images to start off with. I think it's, um, yeah, I don't know. Photographer, filmmaker, digital artist is probably yeah. the easiest three to or break down creative, to. creative, right? Yeah, creative, creative. Modern creative is probably the best way to describe it. It's like I, I like to dip my toes in everything. I don't really like to be restricted to one thing. It's like... Um, you know, some Don't put days, chains on me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like some days, some days I like to make videos. Some days I like to take photos. Yep. Some days I just like to sit behind my computer and see how many stock images I can jam into one. <laughs> it's like you know, I don't like to be restricted to. You know, if 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 you're out and for whatever reason conditions aren't lining up, I don't like to be stressed about that. I like to get out and be like, oh well, I got up early. I've got a day to go and do it, and yeah. maybe I'll create something out of the blue this afternoon on my computer. Maybe I'll head out for sunrise tomorrow and take the best image i've ever taken so Mm. and it i think i'm i'm very thankful that the fact that i've got images that have done extremely well on my photography account that are pure photography and there haven't been you know it's manipulated only in lightroom a little bit of changes and some color manipulations and then i've got images that have done extremely well that zero it is mine it's like most of it is you know i've got one that's like seven stock images jammed together it's like Mm. some of my most recent work that's done the best has been stock images that i've jammed together like i might find four or five images and just be like i like that sky i like that foreground i like that subject i like that planet let's throw it into one yeah so let's make something yeah it's an interesting journey though right because i think when i first started following you digital art wasn't your thing no not at all and and it's super strange because i think if the the photo i remember seeing of yours and i I followed you. I think it was, I don't, and I don't know it too well. I think it was probably from St Kilda. Mm. It was like a long exposure, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think you even shoot that at all anymore, right? No, like no. So like, I don't. And even if yeah. you posted that now, I, I don't think I'd be even be that impressed. But no. I remember at the time I was so impressed. Like yeah. I, I, I loved your work. I started following you. you had hardly any followers back yeah, then. Probably it's, like a thousand or two, maybe. And yeah, it's interesting. It's been a it's been a strange journey. I think I think Photoshop is such a it's such a cool thing. The fact that like. I feel 
like a complete beginner some days and then some days I feel like I know everything. And yeah. it's like you never get caught. I got bored of Lightroom pretty quickly. <laughs> I think I, I used to be a painter. So back when I was younger, that's how I got my start being yeah. a creative. I was a painter and a drawer. Um, I used to paint and draw portraits, which I think is funny now considering I'm getting into doing portraits. But um, full circle, hey? <laughs> yeah, full circle. But it's, I think, when you're using paint you're only restricted to what your mind can create it's like you're only restricted by you know the limitations that are set out by my art teacher at the time Mm. and i think the same thing was with photoshop it's like you're only limited by how much you know and i think that's pretty awesome the fact that i can create anything like i have an idea that comes to my mind and and uh, like i'm able to it's like a math equation it's like i've got to go i've got to put that idea on paper and then i've got to figure out how to create it and it's trial and error it's tutorials it's you know past experience it's awesome you, like, and i i think a lot of people and i know sometimes when when they when it comes to uh digit digitally manipulating photos people sometimes have an issue with that mm. um was that ever the case during your journey of that like did you feel um, like oh this is not I don't know. I think like a lot of people call out not real and photoshopped and and quite clearly they are. Like it's just like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not trying to pretend to make it real. I think that's, I think that's the key statement that meant that I didn't get hit with as much criticism as some people might. I think the reason I'm not a portrait, I wasn't a portrait photographer when I started doing it. I think if I was a portrait photographer and I started doing it, and I was bad, <laughs> like <laughs> back in the times when my scar replacements were horrible and my retouching was terrible, I think I probably would have gotten a lot more crap then because I'm playing with someone's face. Yeah, I think the reason why I never sort of got issue with it is because one, I wasn't trying to, like I post all my before and afters. Everyone who follows me knows mm. that I did. Sure, I get some people that see me in their explore page and they're like, this isn't real. Or when my images get posted on Reddit, that's the worst. If you want to have a laugh, go and find my images on Reddit. <laughs> um, ruthless oh, on Reddit. Ruthless, ruthless on Reddit. But no, it's like I think the reason my real audience have never had an issue with it because they know that it's genuine. They know that I'm not trying to trick anyone. They know that it's it's whatever. But it's also, I think, landscape I think it was, I caught the up draft very yeah. quickly. I think that's why my account sort of grew very quickly as soon as I started that because there weren't, you know, there there was like visuals of Julius, um, maybe a few other people that were doing landscape digital art back yeah. then. But it sort of, it had its heyday. And I think that the reason why I didn't get as much flack as I would have thought or would have thought now is because it was having its heyday. And there yeah. were a lot of people that were really interested yeah. in it. So... Yeah, and I think yeah. if those people are allowed, you know, they pioneered it almost yeah. to the point where it made it way more acceptable. Yeah. And I think like, and I think it's coming around that way as well where people are just accepting people's creativity because mm. I've i never had an issue with it. I, no, I don't even neither. have an issue with people that do small or large or whatever scale. And so I find it strange that people can be so um, judgmental on them mm. when... Like the photos are just beautiful, mm. right? And they're beautiful to someone, even if it's just yourself. So I, I find it really strange that people go. I find it. I find I it. Funny. Maybe that's just the world of online, right? Like yeah. people just. I find it so funny that the the cheating comments make me laugh the most. <laughs> it's like it's, it's like, like what are we it's, playing? It's harder. Like it's like I'm spending more time doing this. Like wouldn't this be you know yeah. not the opposite of cheating? Like cheating would be figuring out the perfect preset that goes onto every photo so you can just yeah. churn out content like. That would be cheating. I think, I think it's like, it's in, it's interesting. It's very interesting. I think it's because it's different. It comes down to the fact that it's different, and people get uncomfortable when things are different. So yeah, I think it's as simple as that. So, yeah, yeah. So I think it's I think it's just because yeah, it's different, and people people find it, you know, daunting. Different is daunting. So. So talk yeah. to me about your your journey through because I think a lot of people that listen to my podcast are probably in the first 12 months of their creative journey like yeah. where did it start for you like obviously you said painting was a thing for you back mm. in the day um i can't imagine you, you probably stepped away from that for a few years but obviously the the mm. roots of creativity was still there yeah um, um what, what brought you to you know then going into you know photo and video and mm. film and things like that um so i finished when i finished school i i sort of i was very very lucky i had a an ex-girlfriend at the moment, she's my ex-girlfriend. I had her at the time sort of, 
I went to a school that was very orientated on you go to school, you get good grades, you go to university, you get a sustainable job. And I was always the kind of kid that I would give it my all, but the results never showed. Yeah, it's it, like, wasn't, it wasn't really it, Like you, school right? just didn't work. It's like I was yeah. the kind of kid that could put hours and hours and hours and hours into essay writing and I did and then put zero into biology and somehow pull a perfect score out of biology and pull a zero out of English like yep. just didn't make sense for yep. what I was putting into it's like I would push a square into a hole and get a triangle out and yeah that, none of it made sense so school was very not daunting but the idea of going to university and my entire career being derived out of the score yep. that I get at the end it scared me a little bit. I was like, I was like, I can't even control my scores at school. How am I going to control them at university? So she was the first person that sort of said to me, "Is like, why don't you just not go, like take a year off?" And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like I remember my school, I'd already decided to take a year off, and we had an entire day dedicated to applying to universities. And I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs that. all day, just being like, I don't know what to do. Did I'm you like, have an idea of where you wanted to go? Like, you, I, so- I loved. I, I love sport and I love fitness and I love yep. that sort of drive. So I did end up doing six months when I, I, I finished school and I went and studied personal training and then I did that for a while and then got into Deakin for health sciences and I was like, okay, this is kind of down the path hmm. and I just hated every minute of it. So I <laughs> dropped out after half a semester and and personal training was great but I just sort of – I enjoyed – I always – attribute it to it's like running your own business on training wheels Mm. so i really really am glad i did it because it taught me everything about handling my time handling my finances handling clients talking to people meeting new people the stuff they probably should be teaching in school. the stuff they probably (laughs) should be teaching in school how to handle my taxes do all that sort of stuff um yeah the stuff they should be teaching and then i just got burnt out on not having anything creative i sort of you know was working crazy hours earning good money but just not you just didn't feel fulfilled i guess didn't feel fulfilled and then the people that i admired and i still admire and one of them is now my mentor and sort of talks me through you know everything that's outside of i think that's important if you're in the creative field find a mentor that's completely detached from that and just has a good head on his shoulders and can sort of talk to you about things that you don't you know you might come to him with i don't know how to grow on instagram through my creative art and he's going to be like have you thought about doing this and he's like he's got no connection to instagram but he knows that he might have an outside angle that yeah the logistics of yeah of drawing an audience exactly and that's sort of, exa- yeah. that sort of stuff but they work like 80 90 100 hour weeks never see their families and they work relentlessly and i just i saw that and i was like that could be my ceiling and i don't really want that and yeah and i i sort of yeah fell out of it and then uh, in a frantic sort of not knowing what to do, burnt through all of my savings on a trip to Canada for five months <laughs> um, and then came back from it. I bought a camera right before I left for that and um, I don't know, by the time I got back, I'd built up a little bit of a reputation in my hometown as someone who is a photographer, who's a filmmaker and can sort of know his way around a camera and I think off the back of that, I picked up a few free jobs and then off the back of that, I kept going with it and then yeah i just fell in love with it and everything that i did sort of just snowballed into the next thing which is why i think everyone sees it like now i'm still so close to the start line i'm Mm. barely even started just because everything is still so new i'm still discovering it's why i've started portraiture there's still so many things that that way right like a lot of people like look up to someone who has you know fifty thousand followers and they'll be like oh they've made it no no you know and anyone (laughs) that comes to me with a similar comment i'm like no way like you know there's Mm -hmm. like the sky is not even a limit i'm not looking at the sky i'm looking at just the possibilities of where things can go and and don't take that so excited by that and don't take that as like if i'm at like five thousand followers or ten thousand followers that you're not anywhere yeah that's still a huge accomplishment all we're trying to say is like these people that have sort of look at their growth like i started instagram in end of 27 middle of 2017 it's like if you look at that growth i'm only two years into my career yeah in this industry it's like any other industry you would look at a someone who's two years in as a rookie yeah. there's someone who doesn't you know they're sort of getting to know the ropes they're sure. sort of climbing up the corporate ladder they're doing their thing they're getting close with the boss that sort of stuff like but they're not 
a professional. They're not ready to go out and start consulting. They're not ready to go out and teach people. And I think that social media sort of, yes, there's an element of it sort of fast tracks everything. Everything through social media is faster and that's why people grow faster. But I think that you, you need to remember that these people are just people and that they did it the exact same way that you did it. And yeah, they're no, and they're just, I mean, there's obviously some exceptionally talented yeah, people yeah. out there, but there's, there's, there's way more that just know how to work hard. Yeah. And, and they're usually just unique. Like if, like I, I get, <laughs> I get, I was researching a video idea the other day and it's like Insta- how to grow on Instagram. And I really want to make a video that's more genuine than all of those videos. Cause I see these videos and they're like, comment on hundreds of posts a day yeah. and follow and follow and like make sure that your content is being put out every single day and post 15 stories and that sort of stuff. And I'm like, even I made a video about that last year and it's like, my opinion on it now is like, look around to all the people that you really admire. Like look around mm. to like, you know, for me, that's like Carl Shakur and yep. Sam Calder and, and Peter McKinnon even like yep. the reason why they blow up is because they're unique. Like yeah. It's got and nothing they're to do. completely themselves. Exactly. Right? It's got nothing to do with like, they like followed a bunch of people. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the algorithm. It's got nothing to do with them liking a bunch of posts every day. It's the, I'm sure, like, sure that's like part of the process. Yeah, it's but, part of it. But yeah. like in the beginning, but like, being unique is what made them blow up. Peter yep. McKinnon, like, it's like, um, uh, what's her name? Sorella Moore on yep. on YouTube and Instagram. She makes videos about posing for women who want to take photos of themselves. Yep. I'm glued to them. Like, yeah. I'm sitting there as a dude with a beard. Like, I'm yeah. sitting there <laughs> sitting like, this is amazing. This is amazing. And it's just because Sorel is this energetic and yeah, she can beautiful captivate human you that way, being right? and just captivates you. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's like someone like Carl Shakur is like, he didn't blow up because he liked a bunch of photos on Instagram and joined an engagement group. He blew up because his photos are incredible. Yeah. He blew up because he's unique and he blew up because he's an energetic person that can really, you know, you. every time Carl posts anything, he posted a graduation video that he shot on his iPhone <laughs> and I liked it immediately yeah. and commented on it. I was like, I don't care about his graduation. Yeah. I care about his photography, but I love him. Yeah. And I think people forget that when they start out this Instagram journey, they forget like, you know, every one of us have something that makes us unique. Every single one of us have something that makes us individual. Try and figure out what that is and just capitalize on that. It's it's an interesting thing when it comes to, especially like photographers mm. and even videographers to, to an extent, but where you may, you know, produce some amazing work, but a lot of people are just afraid of getting on the other side of mm. the lens and then showing themselves and building their own personal brand. Like you say, like, you know, you you know Carl's work and mm. you know his face because he shows both, mm. right? And then he's obviously building out his personal brand there. And I think what I admire about what you're doing is you're really starting to do that well. Mm. And it's something that I've definitely started thinking about a little bit more and how, mm. you know, I don't want people to, I don't want my work to be commoditized. I want people to under, appreciate not just my work, but the person who's creating the work as well. Mm. Um what are your thoughts about, like, why do you think photographers are so, mm, um, like, I don't know. I don't weird? know. I, I think it's, I think we, we, we're we all, in a way, we started taking photos because we're not confident enough to be in front of the camera. So, we prefer to be behind the camera. As subconscious as that might be for some of us, obviously, there's those of us that bought the camera to take photos of themselves because they're a little bit vain or whatever <laughs> it is. But I think we all started out because we think that we are more capable of taking better photos of other people than we are taking photos of ourselves. And yeah. I think it's it's also very foreign. It's just weird. Like how much flack did you get when you first started your Instagram and started posting like, you know, with hashtags and started yeah. writing long captions and stuff like that? It's the same thing. My mates send me a... I posted a video yesterday and I get bombarded with messages being like, oh, this part was hilarious. Tom, you're such a dickhead. That start was boring. Like what are you doing? Like... Like, obviously, they're my best mates and they're doing it because they think it's funny and I yep. don't care. If I cared, I wouldn't be doing it. That's right. But it's like, that's just part of it. It's So, so what do you think? Of- what's your advice then? Because it's not like, we, we spoke about this earlier. Mm. It's not a natural thing. Like no, some people no. might be, but for, I would say the vast majority of people, it's not a natural yeah. thing yeah. to just be in front and speak to, you know, be mm. a talking head on camera. Mm. You know, I think a lot of... You know, the Instagrammers who, the girl Insta- Instagrammers out there do it mm. quite well because they're so confident in themselves. But I think for photographers or other creatives, 
they do it way less because maybe yeah. they're confident in their work, but not, they're not confident in themselves. Yeah. I think exposure therapy is the main thing. Just do it a lot. Like, yeah. And like, you know, I think a good, good thing that I did in the beginning was I, um, I made a video and I sent it to my girlfriend, Georgie. And I was like, what do you think of this? And she sent me, and she's honest with me. Like she's the kind of, <laughs> she'll tell me if my photos are crap. She'll tell me if my photos are good. She'll tell me if my videos are crap. Yeah. She'll tell me if they're good. And, you know, she would give me things like she'd be like, Tom, you're really emotive with your eyebrows on your videos, but you're not really <laughs> like that in person. And I'll be like, okay, well, that makes sense. Like I'll try and relax a little bit more and be a little bit more natural. Mm. And then I'd send her another video and she'd be like, you're very like upbeat with your voice. Like you're not really like that. Like be natural and yeah. just relax. And and the more I sort of went back and forth with her, find someone you're comfortable with. You don't need to spend hours making videos, but maybe get the advice from the people that you actually admire and yeah. the people that actually mean something to you and the people that actually care about you before you start listening to YouTube comments and before you start listening to your bunch of mates that you're going to have beers with on a Saturday night. It's like get the advice from, you know, your family, from your brother, from your sister, from your wife, from your girlfriend, from your boyfriend. Like don't stop worrying about the the it's advice from people <laughs> that don't matter. It's an interesting one, right? Because some of my like I, I always seek, um, you know, feedback from my wife, Crystal, and for the most part, she's pretty good, but yeah. technically she's not like she, and she doesn't care to be either. And yeah. sometimes I'll show her a video or a photo and I know that there are huge flaws in it, mm. but I just want to get her initial reaction and her mm. feedback. And most of the time it's like, oh, it's really good. Mm. And, and most of the time I'm looking for her initial reaction because her words sometimes are not exactly mm. the way I'm the way I, I'm, I'm what i'm looking for and i know that there's something wrong and so sometimes her reaction might be something like oh wow right and then that's <laughs> kind of the one i'm looking for but yeah. if she goes oh it's good mm. then i know it's not good <laughs> yeah yeah right but she doesn't she's not able to give me that like and i think that's awesome that georgie's mm. able to give yeah you that. <laughs> yeah i think i think yeah, yeah direct georgie, feedback georgie and i very early on just became brutally honest with each other i think it's yeah, it is it's the, the best way to, place to be. It's the like, way as long as you know trust. how like the other person can take it, they can yeah. take it, and you can be yeah. really on. It's the best place. It's so funny. Like it's it's funny because it's it's so it just leads to blind trust. It's like if yeah. you can on it, trust starts with honesty. And I think that funny. We're getting into a relationship podcast right, here. here. We go. Mm. Um, no, it's like it, it, like I trust her blindly to almost to a fault. It's like <laughs> like you would. You know, if she came to me and said, I cheated on you, I'd probably be like, I don't believe you. (laughs) (laughs) It's like little things like that where, you know, it's just the way it is. And she's one of the only people that I can be like, what do you think of this? And she'd be like, this is shit. Yeah. (laughs) Or this is really good. Or this is okay. So it's, I think having someone like that is good. And you might not find it in your partner. You might find it in your dad or your brother. Well, sometimes you won't actually find it in those ones close to you because... They're worried about hurting you. Yeah, they're worried about hurting you. And they Mm. don't want to give you honest feedback because even though that's what you need, Mm. sometimes they're they're too scared of hurting Mm. you. And I think there's there's a great... So you have to really find those people, right? Yeah. But it's also just having that conversation. It's a great thing that Gary Vee said. It's like sit down with like your five closest people and ask them to genuinely critique what you're doing and tell you what you're good at and what you're bad at. And that's a good way of figuring out exactly what you are. It's like sit down with... Even if it's just one person, sit down with your girlfriend, sit down with your boyfriend and just be like, what am I doing well? What am I not doing well? And that can be career, relationship, whatever. And just having those genuine conversations can really put you in a, a better place yeah. in all aspects of your life. So yeah. it's, yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful to have her and have her, uh, have her honesty as brutal as it can be yeah. sometimes. <laughs> so no, it's good. Oh, that's good. I think, I think if, if anyone's worried about being uh, more open with their Instagram account and being more, turning it into more of a brand and you rather than your work, I think like the main reason I did it is because I got sick of the rat race of chasing likes. It's like when your work becomes a commodity, which mine did to a certain extent, it was at the point where it's like I got really good engagement, but the only reason I got no engagement is because I was posting five, six, seven times a week with work yeah. that was was my best work and it was very hard to maintain but gave me incredible results. Yeah, But like I'm now trying to get myself to the point where people don't care what I post. They 
care about what I am doing and yeah. what I am putting out they and want that to sort of you stuff. Exactly. As a person. So it's like if you're in the place where you're getting sick of chasing the rat race and you're getting sick of chasing likes and you're like, I can't keep up this workload, it's like maybe put your posts down to two or three a week or mm. one or two a week and post more stories. Just be like, this week I'm gonna rather than I'm focusing on posting six posts, I'm gonna post 10 stories a day yep. or I'm going to do three live streams or I'm going to do whatever because it just makes it like my growth sort of stalled out for a while and this week I've posted twice and it's been the biggest week of growth that I've had in months and it's like wow. from two posts and those posts didn't do incredibly well that it both didn't go viral like I think one sitting at about 6k likes and one sitting at about four um just purely off the back i think one yeah. of my live streams managed to hit the explore page and that really? got it and then then obviously maybe word of mouth maybe people are talking like it's just like it, it could be any reason it could be it could not be related at all but it's funny that you know social media will reward you for being honest and it will reward you for being unique so i think that's it right like the the more genuine and the more hard working you can be i think that's where luck gets created for you mm. right like you're you're then tapping into these areas where um you're putting yourself in the best position mm. regardless of whether or not you're you're doing unrealistic hustle mm. um but you, you're still placing yourself in a position where you can be successful yeah mm. and i think i think we all need a, a, a portion of that success to kind of yeah get those little dopamine yeah. hits i guess you know mm. like where we can feel like we're getting feedback enough to a point where mm hey, what I'm doing is resonating. And that's, mm. I think that's what everyone really is looking for. You know, they're mm. looking for, you know, acceptance and, you know, for what they do to be perceived as something that's good. And Yeah. Yeah, um, and don't, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong at all. I'm not trying to be arty-farty or anything like that and be yeah. like, I'm doing it for the love of it and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's like, no, you need, you can't do it for the money and you can't do it for the likes, but you also can't just do it for the love. Yeah. It's like if you're chasing likes and chasing money, you're going to fail. If you're only doing it for the love of it, you're going to fail. I have artist friends, like, God bless them, but I have musician friends that just like, I tell them, I'm like, release music, release music, release music, yep. release music. And they'll be like, no, no, I'm, i got to get the marketing perfect before I release it. I can only release like one EP every six months and stuff like that. And it's like, no, if you just released a song every week or a song every month, you would do so much better than trying to build up a marketing campaign on yeah. an audience that you don't have. It's like, it's the same thing. It's on the opposite end. I know plenty of people that, you know, as much as I love catching up with people on Instagram and I love catching up with um, people that want to hang out, it's like I know immediately when someone's catching up and they're like, all they care about is the likes and all they care about is how many followers you've got and yeah. all they care about is, you know, what they can do to try and build an audience and it's like yeah i'm happy to have those conversations and i'm happy to talk to you about yeah, that sort of stuff for that but when it's the but when it's all you care about point, it's it's not going to work yeah. so it, it's not you need to there's extremes on both end and you can't operate in either end of those extremes there are people there are outliers you know there are people like <laughs> justin leduc who posted that grim reaper thing of the westgate bridge or the golden gate bridge golden gate, yeah it's like he does it for the love of it. He only posts two or three times a month and just so happened to, oh, sorry, oh, only posts like once every six months and just by the luck of it, one of his posts goes bonkers and he's now got What did he get? He got like 000. a million followers in like a week or something, didn't he? He got 600,000 followers in a few days. <laughs> it's just mental. What is he at now? I don't, I, I don't even follow him. I remember seeing I can't. Work. I can't remember. I followed him, but he just doesn't post very often. And That's then there's people, like, there's people like Callop as well who of similar to Justin LaDuke, but viral continuously. Like he's gained, Callop has gained seven, 600,000 followers in the space of about a year. And it's purely been on the fact that he posts so relentlessly and consistently with beautiful images that you can't help follow him. So there's definitely yeah. extremes on both ends and there's outliers and you can't really, I think that if you pay attention to the, there's, things that are consistently happening there's something there it's like you know i know so many people in australia that have 10 20 30 40 thousand followers so there's definitely something there it's like you yep. need to pay attention to those things and be like okay what's going on here whereas yep. the people that blow up overnight yeah those are amazing stories and they're cool to talk about and and it's like everyone wishes that could happen to them but 
it's yeah, but often the, a lot the, like the people like I mean, Justin's still producing amazing work. Right? Oh no, don't get me and wrong. So, his, his entire career is built off. And you know, some people doing get really sort of offended by overnight successes, right? Like I don't I've, I've care. been, I've I've had some, um, you know, some huge features that have given me mm. multiple thousands of followers in a day, mm. and um, and I think some people may look at that and go, oh, like he's just gained so, so much. So lucky, like it's a, like, yeah. But people aren't seeing like you know the months or years of just overnight, grinding yeah. of overnight, honing yeah. and. It's like the so, term overnight success that took ten years. Yeah. <laughs> it's like That's you only see it once it you know the majority of people only like if i for whatever reason posted a photo tonight that got 100,000 likes and gained me 300,000 followers those 300,000 followers just discovered me today so they don't know the last two years of work they don't know the two years before that that i was and learning about business and marketing of yeah. people saying oh look at this guy overnight blew up overnight it's like that sort of <laughs> stuff it's like no like yeah so it's it's yeah it's pay uh, like this social media thing is is funny. <laughs> it's yeah. funny, but you need to uh, you need to find a happy medium. It's like I think a good thing that um uh, what's her name? Uh, I can't, God, I can't remember her name, but um she has a good thing that she says where it's like two for them, one for me. Yeah, it's like make two pieces of content for you know if you're a if you're a, an artist who's making music and you really don't like releasing too much music, well maybe save that one for you that you post every. You know, you release something once every three months, and in the me in the meantime, post like two two minute songs, yeah, or like a a one minute song, or just like an instrumental or something. Like, give them something, yeah. Two for them, one for you. It's the same thing with me. It's like it's my, that balance, right? Yeah. I love that. I think that's mm. awesome. Yeah, I think that, use that keeps you sane. It yep. Keeps you sane. It's the same thing that I'm trying to do with my YouTube channel now. It's like, you know, I. I not that I don't love it. I love doing the Q&As. I love doing the tutorials and stuff. But I really love doing the videos where I sit down and just spill some thoughts or talk to you guys about, you know, my burnout video or talk to you guys about being unique or whatever it is or, yeah. you know, those videos where I just talk. But I know that you guys want to see how I create things. You guys want to mm. hear me answer your questions. You guys want to hear me do things that uh, you guys really want to do. It's like maybe in time there will be an audience for my videos that I like, but I know at the moment it's like I'm going to yeah. make a bunch for you guys and then I'm going to make one for me. Yeah, A bunch for it. you guys, one for me. So. Yeah, every time like people, whenever ask like what do you want to know about, it's all about editing. People yeah. want to know about the edit, how it's produced, how can I be more like that in terms of the way or like what are you shooting with? I don't know. We just spoke about that before. Yeah. Actually, before we go too much further, I ask yeah. everyone, what are you shooting with? What's in so, your bag? <laughs> What's in my camera Let's bag? Let's get this over I'm and done with now. I'm about and to then we'll, And then we'll preface, oh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go through yeah. it after. Yeah, I'm, I shoot on a, a Canon 1DX Mark II, which is a, a beast of a thing. And then I, I, my main lens that stays on that body is my 24 to 70 Mark II 2.8. Yeah, uh, I have a eighty-five one point four, which is my favorite lens on the planet. If I, that's so beautiful. You know, if I could shoot landscapes one. with it, I would shoot landscapes with it. Um, I love I, that pairing as well. The yeah. eighty-five and the one DX is it's stunning. Just, it's just all cream. It's beautiful. I'm shooting on it right now, so you guys will see the footage. But it's it's beautiful. And then I have my seventy to two hundred, and I also have a, a two times converter. So I've got about you know from 24 to 400 mils worth of focal length and then i shoot on my mavic 2 pro yeah mavic 2 pro yeah uh, i was about to say mavic 2.0 mavic 2, 2. pro 0. <laughs> mavic 2 pro which is again an absolute beast and then you know you've got your all sorts of goodies and stuff in there i shoot on a ronin s as well when i'm doing my yep. commercial work so but yeah that's my my rig i try to keep it as, as for as much videography work as i do i try to keep it as light as possible i don't like to be slowed down by you know big gear and that sort of stuff as much as i would love to get my hands on a red or hands on a c200 i always have the opinion where it's like that's only going to shut off maybe 20 <laughs> percent of the times where i would do it it's like if i was using a red maybe the times where i go out for sunrise i'm not going to pack the red no, or yeah. maybe the times where something happens out of the blue i'm not going to go switch it on because it's got to boot up and then i've got to Make sure it's all attached. It's interesting though, right? Where you say like, you know, I'm I'm not going to go to because most people probably listening to this would think about a one DX. <laughs> I'm thinking like that is a huge step up. To yeah, like a big heavy. No, I you know. I don't know. I actually really like. It's actually one of like, people. Nice people, man. Yeah. yeah, people say it's like they don't like 
the one dx because it's heavy yeah it's like i really like it because it's heavy <laughs> yeah. it's like i like to feel like i'm you know i like to feel like i can hit someone with my camera it's yeah. like i like to feel like and it I would can, survive and yeah come best. <laughs> i like to feel like i can drop it and it's gonna be fine i like to feel like you know i've been under waterfalls with that thing i've been mm. under you know i've been in the snow with that thing of yeah I've like in my last podcast, I've I've been talking up Sony a lot because I love the way that they have innovated and the way that they mm. um, listen to their customers, and I think mm. they do that better than any other camera brand. Um, in the last podcast, I said that there's only one DSLR camera that I think does a half decent job at video, and mm. that's the One DX. Yeah. Two. yeah. Is that is that the reason why yeah. you own that one? Yeah, I mean, 100%. it's half decent at photo as well, but mm. I think it's probably the best hybrid. No, it is. It is the probably as far as it is the best hybrid on the on the market. The yeah. thing that it it does suffer. First of all, it's a DSLR. So yeah. as much as you know, your traditionalists out there love your DSLRs. It's funny, so calling a DSLR traditionalist, <laughs> know, considering right? it's only been what fifteen years That's since like, we moved from film. Yeah. Yeah. Is that really? Yeah, yeah so well, like probably about fifteen years. Ago. Yeah, like it's funny, like calling. Yeah, anyway, it's like <laughs> being a photographer. Um, yeah, you traditionalist photographers out there, mirrorless is the future. It's like yeah. mirrorless is much better. It's like if I'm shooting on, if I'm shooting portraits on a mirrorless camera, I'm gonna nail eighty percent of the f- shots as far yeah. as focus. Whereas if I'm shooting on my one DX, I'll only nail eighty percent if I'm taking my time with every shot yeah. and zooming in and, and making sure that on a focus, 1DX, is the sharp. focus is very good too. The focus is very good, but just yeah. DSLR restrictions. Yeah, it's just the way it. that DSLRs just are restricted. Can't move as quickly. No, can't move as quickly. Can't locate can't things as quickly, as quickly. Can't process the data as quickly. There's just things that it misses out on. But as far as video goes, nothing's better. And I've used, you know, uh, like even even for photo as well it's like i rented a 5d4 the other week because i was shooting a i was photographing my first wedding i've always done a video been a video shooter and i was photographing and i was like i'll, I'll rent a camera that's more suited mm. for video for photos and have my 1dx as my backup, backup yep. i ended up shooting on the 1dx all day i hated the one <laughs> i hated the 5d4 hated it i yeah. shot on it and i was like i don't like this at all what is it that you didn't like was it just the focus or? just like the focus it feels like when you shoot on a one for anyone that's shot on a 1dx you feel every single photo it's like yeah. you take a photo it's like like you yeah. really feel that shutter and you feel like you've taken an image whereas like shooting on the 5d4 was sort of like i didn't really love it and then for what it was giving me you know it was only an extra 10 megapixels so it's like oh, 14 extra 14 megapixels so it wasn't giving me that much extra as far as like mm. detail. I just didn't love it as much. It's yeah. like so I've I've also shot on the EOS R and I've got to give it to the EOS R. I really did love it for photos. Yeah. I did love the EOS R, but for video it just doesn't compete. No. Just doesn't compete for video. I mean unless you're shooting all four K and unless you got yourself a monitor, it just have doesn't you ever compete. have you ever shot on a mirrorless in silent mode? I have not. It's, I've there's been a few times where I've genuinely If you genuinely, love that sh- that shutter, it's yeah. so disorientating. It is weird. It's like I can't think of many situations besides if I was photographing weddings where I would want that shutter. It's like for things like portrait shooting, for landscapes it doesn't matter unless you're shooting wildlife. Yeah. Um for portraits you actually want the shutter because when the model hears the shutter, she knows yeah, a photo has been taken, they can move or change yeah. positions. So there's just not really like situations where i would use it yet no but i think it's a cool feature it's definitely it's, a cool, yeah it's, it is definitely a cool, cool feature. utility so. yeah and, and like for wedding people like it's a no-brainer like yeah if you, if you don't want to be that standout one or you don't want people to move when they hear the shutter mm. i've i've been uh reading some articles lately that the the equivalent of the 1dx mark ii the from a sony point of view is the a9 mm. and from a political point of view, there's a lot of political arenas now that won't allow any Canon shooters in. The only people that are shooting on the A9 are allowed in, like press uh, photographers. Oh, really? Yeah, so there's a lot of... Uh, I've been just seeing lately, just because of how noisy they are. Oh, so true. So you might have a, a, a group of, you know, 100 uh, photographers there and they're all shooting on the 1DX that, that and they're sense. just hearing the shutters. Yeah. It's off-putting, so they just they banned everyone except for the A nine shooters, wow. which is so strange. And well, like, yeah, the the A nine is the camera that I would go to if I was moving to Sony. Besides, maybe the A seven S three when it eventually comes out. Yeah, it eventually comes out. I think that's um, going to be yeah. I'm interested to see what they put in that. Yeah, because as much as I, I was talking to Ben about this earlier, it's like as much as specs, you know, as much as the 
outermost specs like everyone sees the frame rates and the yeah. resolution and the, that sort of stuff it's like you need to pay attention to the bit rates and yeah, the, the codex rate. and that yep. sort of stuff it's like do you want to be spending you know four hundred dollars a month on <laughs> hard drives or do you want to be spending a hundred a month on hard drives it's yep. like there's little things like that that you don't really pay attention to if you're just looking to the outside specs and the a9 is probably the only one that competes with the one dx as far as not only resolution and f- like uh, frame rates, but also the codec yeah. and the bit rate and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's it's interesting. You pay for what you get. As much yeah. as people are like, they knock the seven thousand dollar price tag. You pay. You get what you pay for. Yeah. So I mean, there is a, probably a level of diminishing returns, like yeah, the, the amount of gain you get for the thousands more you spend. Hundred percent. But you still just can't get it anywhere else. So yeah. if you need that, and like you're in that space, like a lot of people who buy these those types of cameras. Mm. They buy it for a very specific reason that yeah. they can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Unless you're just one of those gear whores that yeah. just yeah. love to just buy Just has a lot of money expensive. and likes to spend buy things. Yeah, no, yeah. there's... I think Casey Still Neistat shoot has in a, auto. <laughs> yeah. Shooting in auto on a 1DX would be interesting. <laughs> it's like at least it doesn't have flash. <laughs> I'm sure there's people out there that do it. At least it doesn't have flash. And there's like... Oh, yeah. um, oh man. And like... Uh, oh, that annoys me. I was shooting a wedding three weeks ago and there was this lady there who clearly wasn't happy that the bride and groom spent a couple thousand on a photographer rather than hiring her oh, and hiring, she was just wondering yeah, cell phone yeah shooter not even cell phone for shooter she was shooting on a i think she was shooting on a, a 6d mark ii but oh no not, not a 6d because it had a flash i think she must have been shooting on a 7d2 7d2 i think it must have been because yeah. it was it was it didn't look like an 80d but it had a flash and I was like, I was obviously shooting in auto because she was using flash and it's just like, it annoys me. But anyway, besides the point, it's like, um, oh, I completely lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I like, like it when, when people are at weddings and they're, um, and I've shot a few weddings from a video point. I've never shot one from a photo um, where people do jump in in front of you as if like, yeah, uh, like, like, you, you know, I'm here. Yeah. You know, I'm the prof- yeah. like, you know, professional. Mm. Um I feel terrible for wedding photographers. Like wedding videographers, we're safe. You're very safe. Your job's not going to get replaced anytime soon. But I've been to enough weddings where the photographer's been eating and they didn't tell them that something was special was happening. They just Mm -hmm. organized for, you know, at 9 p.m. The group go out to eat and we rotate. So videographer stays on, photographer goes off. And for whatever reason, changing lenses, changing batteries, changing cards, they miss a moment that's special. Yeah. And someone's sitting there with their phone and they snap that photo, boom. It's like your reputation as a photographer is gone because that photo means more to the bride and groom than yeah, any photo did it. that day just because they captured the special moment. Whereas I think the thing with videography and the reason why I encourage all of you to try videography is because, you know, there's no one at a wedding that's pretending to be a videographer. It's like there might be people that are filming on their phone, but there's no one who's going home and editing for 20 yeah. hours and making a short film about their wedding. There's no one that's, you know, yeah. getting in there and getting shots. There's just no, like no one's there pretending to take your job. And I think that's something that photographers are suffering with. And then the other thing as well is like, you just can't, like you might capture a still laugh or a still smile or a still kiss, but, the main piece of feedback I've gotten from my bride and grooms that I've shot for is like, I've never seen myself laughing or I've never seen myself smiling that hard or I've never seen myself kissing another person. It's like, I've never seen these things in motion and they're suddenly realizing how happy they look and like, you know, it's that. I think it's capturing how they actually felt on the day. Like I I still remember my wedding day because it's just such a a pivotal moment in my life. Mm. And when I see photos of those things, it's more than just seeing a photo that I've, you know, a so selfie with some feeling. friends. Because I remember the feeling I had that day because it was so such a unique and happy feeling. Mm. And so seeing that really just, especially in video format, takes you back. Mm. Takes you, and, and you're immediately connected to the sentiment that you had. Mm. And so I think I always say that like photographers probably have a harder time on Hard, the day. Much harder job. Um, because there's a lot more direction that needs to happen. They have to be yeah. on all the time and... Uh, whereas videographers probably like in terms of the job on the day is a little bit less, but in post it's all it's huge. Video. It's like, yeah, video my, is like, you know, edits can yeah. go days like, whereas, you know, a lot of wedding photographers can get away with a lot of presets. Sometimes I don't know a few wedding photographers that shoot JPEG. They've just customized their 
um, picture styles. So they've I got one that they really it. like. They're really on. They've been shooting for so long that they know their white balance. They're going to nail yep. it. They'll just shoot the JPEGs. So it's it's interesting because yeah, like it's very difficult because I've shot. You know, I was spoiled my first two wedding videos it's like i shot one in jarvis bay and then yeah. shot one in byron bay and those were my first two weddings and just perfect days like yeah. overcast all day and then banger sunset at the end of the day it's the same thing it was like raining drizzling at byron bay overcast so like all the slow motion footage looks amazing <laughs> everyone's skin's really soft the couples were beautiful like <laughs> there's yeah. the couple that i shot in byron bay could easily be like a model couple that a videographer would hire to fake that's a wedding always, that's always helps <laughs> it's like just like beautiful people beautiful wedding beautiful crowd it's like beautiful setup it's like and then you've got a my biggest struggle is like you get hired to go and shoot a in church wedding with no light and you know yeah. really sunny day really harsh lighting it's like your couple is expecting them to receive a video that's just as good as the one you shot yeah. in perfect conditions at Byron Bay on the beach compared to their video in a church with no lighting. So, so do, you, do you manage expectations that way or do you just, I don't, I, I you try, just try to and just, work around it and just produce yeah. like... The best I, I just produce the best I can. I think that if they've got those expectations, you know, they experience their day. It's yeah. like they know... I think the goal should always be to make it slightly better than yeah. what they experienced your video should always make them feel a little bit better than what they felt on the day yeah I think it's like so. try and make it try and make them remember it just a little better than they thought they did yeah but if they've got expectations that their video is going to be like the videos that you see online that are staged and with models and set yeah, up with lighting crews and designed by de interior amazing designers locations. amazing locations like perfect Perfect time of year, beautiful, yeah. you know, the brides, <laughs> bridesmaids are all stunning models yeah. and the, bri the, grooms the groomsmen are all bloody <laughs> six foot four and gorgeous males. Like, it's just like, yeah, if you're expecting your wedding to be like that and it's not, it's in a basement with no light. And yeah, and I think, well, like, I think most of them yeah. understand that anyway. Yeah. And I think most of them, they, they see the feeling they had on the day anyway, unless you get a lot of brides. Which I, I think a lot of people are scared about shooting weddings because of that, but... To be yeah. fair, I don't think there's that many of them. I don't think there's no. that many bridezillas out there no, complaining. I don't know what people, uh, yeah, yeah, I've I had so many people. I I have heard some horror stories. Yeah, but have, they do exist. Yeah, they I'm do just, exist. I just don't, don't get think us wrong. As common as people, are, I don't think they're as common as people people say. It's yeah. like if you shoot fifteen weddings, you're probably going to bump into a bridezilla. Mm. And and the other thing as well is like the average life expectancy of a wedding videographer is usually like twenty to twenty five weddings. It's yeah. like you might usually they'll either then go into another branch and use it as a stepping stone into something else or they'll open a business where they hire people to come and shoot come the weddings that their yeah. audience has given them. So there's it's very rare that someone will shoot themselves as a freelancer more than sort of 15 to 20 yeah, weddings. Yeah. So what is your plan with, uh, from a video perspective, you're in f freelance f f uh, videography. videography. Mm. Do you do any freelance or you do some, some photos? I do well? it for if I get requested by friends or family yeah. like i've got a few people that i used to work with um in the fitness industry that i take their photos and do their social media stuff i've got you know the wedding that i shot a few weeks ago was for a family friend yeah. um if i get asked i'll do it yeah but i i don't advertise myself as a photographer yeah i've always said that i love taking photos for me i hate working as a photographer i love working as a videographer yeah. i don't enjoy working creating videos as much for me i still love it like i still love it but you know creating if i was set out to create like a a video about me and my family and what we do and that sort of stuff i'd probably be deer in the headlights whereas like creating a video <laughs> for someone else i love it yeah so and it's the complete opposite with photography so i i do a little bit but i think my i think my plan is ever evolving it's the same as when i started out it's like i started out doing photo jobs for 90 bucks an hour or whatever it is or 90 bucks for a shoot and edits so less than that an hour um and then i evolved into doing social media and then evolved into doing videography and then evolved into doing sports and then evolved into doing weddings i think i want to get into i really want to see where this youtube thing is going to go it's like yeah, well, that was going to be my my next question to you because like it, it's it's quite clear from anyone who follows or watches what you do mm. is it seems like you're very intentional about especially venturing into certain channels, right? Like, um, mm. 
you've only recently opened up a Twitter channel. Mm. You've opened up YouTube as a thing. You've even spoken to me about potentially doing a podcast in the future. Mm. Um, and those, to decide to do those things, I, I think everyone just kind of opens up Instagram or opens up a Facebook page because that's just what everyone does. Mm. But not everyone's pers- purposeful mm. in opening up something like YouTube and being direct yeah. with that. So. I can see that that's that's intentional for you, but where where do you see yourself going with that? What's the plan? Is there a plan? Yeah, a roadmap. I, th- I don't know. I think I just saw the uh, Instagram gave me an idea of the possibilities of social media. It gave yep. me, it made me realize I'm like, oh, actually, there's a chance with this sort of stuff. There's, it's really powerful, and I realized that backing myself is probably a good idea. Like going yep. after it is probably a good idea. Um, because what's so the worst case scenario, Yeah, what's right? the worst case scenario? Like, it's like if I fail, I can go and get fail. a job. Yeah, <laughs> you like, can still play yeah. in those spaces. Yeah, like, exactly. You know? And at the end of the day, I've got, I can go and get a marketing job. I can go and get a social media job. I could go and get a video editor's job. I could go and become yeah. a cinematographer. I could go and become a director. Like these are all valuable skills that you're learning. Yeah. So there's never, you're never wasting your time going after this thing. Do you think you'd ever enjoy doing that though? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. I was about to say, I, like, definitely not. I, I, I think the same way. Like I always think about like, because I've been working for myself now for the last uh, four years. Yeah, and I you look at it, it in the back of your mind, and I'm like, you know, I I built a successful career um, for a while, and I'm like, in the back of my mind, I could get a very well paying job back in the industry that I mm. used to work in, mm. right? And so I was in the drinks business, in sales, and um, and I could get an exec role, paying you know a, a decent triple figure, a uh, sorry triple figure, yeah, triple figure, that'd be amazing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a six figure job, yeah, right? And um, I'm like, oh, that'd be a great fallback, but would I ever want to do that again? Never. Mm. Not yeah. like I would feel so terrible about myself moving back into that mm. space. Um, yeah. And even if it was a step ahead of where I was before, I still don't think I would enjoy that. I'd just be thinking about, you know, growing into my own personal journey. Mm. Like I, don't, I feel like going back backwards is just never an option. Yeah, um, I think I think what I mean, it's just like. Don't be worried. If your parents are in a situation, like it, there's always someone in your life that's yeah. trying to tell you like, be, be safe. take the safe option. Yeah. It's like, what's not safe about doing it? Like you're learning a skill, you're getting better at that skill whilst doing it and you're getting real life experience and worst case scenario, best case scenario, you're going to live, <laughs> do the thing that you love every single yeah. day and do whatever you want and, and worst case scenario, probably scenarios, be rewarded for it, yeah. right? You know? And worst case scenario is you get a job. Yeah, like what's gonna happen? Like, you really don't worry about it. But I think, and I think, I don't. I think a lot of people aren't considering that worst case scenario enough. Like, they look at mm. it and go, "It's just like I need to wait till I'm perfect. I need to wait till things are mm. better. Or wh- when I'm in a position, when I have more money, or you know, mm. when when things are my ducks are lined up." But I think if people just consider the worst case is not bad. Yeah, it's not as yeah. bad as you think. No, and just having a yeah, having a like. Step out, give it a crack. (laughs) Honestly, like literally that's all it takes. Like and and it's funny because there's such a stigma around now where it's like YouTube is so hard to do now. It's so oversaturated. Like don't even bother. There's no there's no space for anyone to jump in there. Like Instagram, (laughs) same thing. They're like, Oh, it's so oversaturated. So where was Peter McKinnon eighteen months ago? Exactly. It's the same thing. And it's like I don't actually think it's that hard. I think people suck themselves out. I think people, you know, spend too much time worrying about I don't have the perfect gear. I don't have the perfect lighting. I don't have the perfect you know, I'm too young. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't know this. I don't know that. It's like if you just started Let's break it down. It's like if you post a video a week for a year, you're going to be better than where you are now. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> No matter right. what those videos are, even if it's 10 subscribers over that year, you're going to be better than where you are now. What, you know, best just focus on that. Focus on being consistent for a year. It's like I've always said that I've throughout this journey on Instagram, like my growth has been, yeah, I caught like between 20 and 40, that was that was quick. That was about two months between 20 and 40. Yeah, crazy. But my first 20,000 followers took me a year and a half to get yeah. to. And it's like that was, you know, periods of months where, sorry, longer than that, like two years to mm. get to 20,000 followers. It was, a, it was a period of like, you know, no followers, periods of fast followers, periods of whatever, periods of okay. And it, all it was was just consistently posting content and consistently getting better. It's like I've met so many people that sort of come in and they skyrocket and they come in and just gain like 10,000 followers overnight and then they stop posting. And then I've met people that come in and they try it for like a month yep. and they're like, oh, I'm getting nothing and then give up. It's like you need to, consistency is the main reason. I think the reason why everyone has this stigma around um, it being so difficult is because people don't give it enough of a crack. 
It's like back yourself and give yourself some time. I think that I think that that's so important because discoverability is so much higher on YouTube. Yeah, like the possibility for someone to search up ocean and find you, like that just doesn't happen on podcasting apps and on Spotify. No, that's right. And I think like I've I've started in doing. I don't know if we are recording anyway. Yeah. Um, I've started on podcasts purely because I know that that's an easier. I'm looking at low hanging fruit in terms of not in terms of growing an audience because I think mm. it's a it's a much longer term burn mm. there, uh, but I'm doing it because I think it's something that I want to do and I think I see an easy way of doing that. Getting into YouTube, I think, is a little bit more. It takes a little bit more commitment mm. where because um, I don't want to stop and start talking to people is what I do anyway. Yeah. Right? So like yeah. I I could ha- I could be having this conversation with you right mm. now at any point. Mm. Um. But making a video consistently once a week or whatever it might be takes mm. a little bit more from, and I still plan on doing that. Mm. I think that's the that's the plan with it. But so yeah. is that is that where you see yourself shifting? Like if you start getting yeah. way more momentum on yeah. YouTube, is that where you feel like Man, I'll put I think, all my eggs in that I think, basket? I think a hundred percent. I think yeah, because I've my goal has always been. I don't do well with people telling me what to do. <laughs> I've never, <laughs> it's like, I've got a, like my dad. A lot of a, us creators are like that, right? It's so yeah. funny. Oh, especially for people my, like who, who don't know yeah, the world of I think industry. it's just, I think it's more just a, being an entrepreneur, freelancer, individual, yeah. that sort of stuff. It's my old man has worked for himself for 60 years now and he had a boss for two days or two weeks, <laughs> two days or two weeks. And I think the last conversation he had with him was telling him to get I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but might have beep it out. But like he's told me that story where it's like he had a boss for two days or two weeks or whatever it was, couldn't handle it. Like my first and last boss I ever had butted heads with. And like looking back now, it's like I can have a conversation with him and and I respect him and he respects me and it's it's a place of mutual respect. But when you're trying to run your own ship, it's pretty hard to have two captains. Like it's not enough room for that to happen. And, And I just, I can't like do it in a situation where I'm being told what to do. And I think the thing with YouTube that's so admirable for me is I want to create the videos that I'm going to create anyway. Yeah. Not that I don't want to, like I want to give my all to, I want to make a documentary and I don't want to have to worry about funding. I want to, you know, I want to shoot, like I've got, I've got a bunch of mates that are doing some amazing things and very cool things in the you fitness industry and the, with sport and with, the environment and all that sort of stuff. I want to go out and tell that story. It's like mm. when you're working as a freelancer, you just can't afford to. No, that's right. It's like, but if I've got an audience that loves my work and I've got an audience that really wants to listen to what I've got to say, it's like I can spend the money that I'm earning to go out and create the things that I want to create. And I think that's like, it's extremely audacious. Like living mm. a life where you get to create the things that you want to create and get paid to do it is extremely audacious but if there's a chance i really want to go after it but this, and the and the like worst case scenario again is you again, you still continue to create, go back to my freelance create things that you are still happy with yeah like you know you're still going to pr- produce content that still pleases you exactly regardless if it's going to pay your bills or not yeah you know? so, don't don't get me wrong this freelancing freelancing is amazing freelancing is really good it's stressful it is stressful and it has its moments but it's it's better than working for someone else. Yeah. It's much better than working for someone else. And if there's ever a day in the history of time Mm -hmm. where it it has been easier, it's, it just gets easier every day. Oh my God. If you're an artist in 2019 and you're not trying to work for yourself, you need to go and do it right now. You have to have a very good reason why you're not, right? Like Like you literally need to leave your, like do what, drop whatever you're doing right now and go and figure out how you can start sharing your work with the world because there has literally never been a better time to be an artist. Yeah. There has never been a better time to be an artist. Yeah. Ever. Like you need to be sharing your art with the world, whatever Mm. it is, whether it's painting, whether it's drawing. Like I follow this girl from Hawaii who does uh, like metallic drip on canvas. Oh, yeah. And it's like, how niche can you possibly get? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, she's killing it. Like she's yeah. got like three stores in Hawaii, one in America, like a bunch of other stores. And like her things are amazing. And it's like, mm. that is just wouldn't have been possible 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah she might've been like a cult hero in Hawaii. She might've had a bit of a, you know, a local, local fame, but it wouldn't have been nearly as big as it is now. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's like people like Peter McKinnon, like people mm. like those guys that you really look up to, there's just so many people living their lives 
based on the artwork that they're creating. And I think there's literally never been a better time to be an artist. Yep. There has never been a better time to be an artist. And it's weird, right? Because like my my main business that pays my bills is like I run my own business from home, which is mm. on, on an on, online business, which is e-commerce based. We sell, buy and sell goods. Mm. Um, and I say to everyone who asks me about that, is everyone? I think I feel like everyone should have some sort of side hustle, mm. right? Where even if you're your side hustle your is own, your main thing, yeah. Well, who knows mm. if it, it may one day, like it did for me, turn mm. into my main thing. Yeah, it paid. It paid me three times. Actually, the, the month that I quit, mm. my paycheck that I was earning from my side hustle was 10x what my <laughs> salary was. And I said, this just doesn't make sense when I'm working yeah. you know, a 60-hour week doing this yeah. exec, exec role. And then coming home and burning yeah. both candles. Like, yeah. yeah. And so I just felt like, well, my income is not actually... Like the majority of my income is coming from elsewhere. This just doesn't mm. make sense. I've got to mm. leave this. I have to leave it. No, and, and yeah, I think, there's no safety net yeah. there, right? And I think what makes it the best time to be an artist isn't the fact that you're going to make money from your art. I think it's that there's so many revenue streams. Yeah. Like there's so many possibilities. Like, you know, the people that you really admire on social media and YouTube, I can guarantee they've got at least four or five different revenue streams yeah. that they're getting money from. They might not be making, you know, you might see their Instagram and they're like, oh, they must be making so much from Instagram. <laughs> You'd probably be surprised. Yeah. They're probably barely making minimum wage on their Instagram, but they've also got affiliate marketing and they're also selling prints and they're also selling presets and they're selling, you know, blog. They've got a blog. Hey, they're doing jobs a YouTube for free channel. still, right? Some they're still them. doing jobs for free. They're yeah. still doing freelance. Like, I think it's having multiple revenue streams that's a really the thing that makes it so possible to be an artist these days. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very exciting. I'm I'm like I love it. Like I'm I'm a little bit older than most people getting into these creative mm. spaces now, but I've been doing it forever as well. Mm. Right, I'm 35 now. How old are you? 22. 22. <laughs> so I've got 13 years on you, mm. which is know, which is so strange because like, I feel like I relate to you a lot as well. Mm. So I don't if feel like I'm I've, another I've, generation. There used to be a there used to be a running joke at the gym I used to work at where none of the other PTs were allowed to tell my clients how old I was. <laughs> it's like I think I was I was 18 or 17 at the time, and I had, still, had you this still, me had yeah, exactly. still had a beard. Still had a beard. Exactly. I still had a beard and still whatever. And all my clients were, you know, mid thirties, forties, fifties, and it's like if they had known that I was eighteen years old, telling them what to do, they probably would have, yeah, get, taken their money back. But it's I've always, always been a little bit of an old head on young shoulders. I don't know what it is, whether I spent a lot of time listening to my old man or, yeah, what it is. But yeah, I feel like I can always relate. But it, it like that sort of idea. It's like I can't even imagine another thirteen years of like. That's the thing. It's like you have so much time. Oh man! Like and 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 Gary V preaches about it a lot. You know, like yeah. you know, fifty years old is young in oh. today's game. Anyone can pick up and start and do things. Like you know, some people like uh, people are always saying, "I've only been uh, doing photography for twelve months or something," or "I've only been shooting video for like the last six months." And I'm like, "Well, you know what? In today's day, mm. like that is nothing. You can learn." quite enough to like yeah it's nothing but you can learn but you, you can, can learn so much like it's yeah. it's not it's not nothing that you can feel like oh I'm, yeah yeah there's a mm. big upside to learning a lot yeah but don't discount like you know no 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 there's definitely like you can yeah the people that go like even in the grand scheme of like if you had gone to you know ny film school 20 years ago and told them my yeah. story of like someone who's gone from zero to freelance full-time in two years I'm like, excuse me? He's barely even finished a film degree. How are you supposed to do yeah. that? Like, so it's it's incredible. And and the amount of people that are one man shows and stuff like that. Like, I remember I worked for a production house for for two months or three months when I first got back from Canada just to get me some income and learn some stuff about the industry without going to uni. And like, I was an editor for them, and they're a fantastic company and probably one of the most innovative production houses. In Australia, as far as real estate videos go, they do yep. high-end real estate videos. But I was still like a card runner getting paid $25 an hour <laughs> on set. Like we'd fly, they'd fly us all to Sydney. There'd be like 10 of us in the crew. There'd be a producer, a director, a cinematographer, an editor who was me on set, then yep. an assistant, talent, a whole like bunch of other people, with talent, talent yeah, blah, blah, blah. And it's like my job on those days was to grab the card from the cinematographer, take it to the computer, dump the footage and then bring the card back to the cinematographer. And it's like, why am I getting paid $25 an hour to do that? It's like, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It's like people are surprised when I show up to set 
and I'm by myself and they're like, oh, do you need an assistant or anything like that? It's like, no, I'm chill. I'm good. <laughs> I'll do it all myself. It's like, yeah, it's just, it's unbelievable the opportunities out there because, you know, there's, if I can give a business the same product that a production house can give them, there's no reason why they should pay the production house because yeah, right. the production house is going to demand 25 grand. But they got to pay all those heads, right? Yeah. They're yeah. going to demand 25 grand for a video that I could do for five. Yeah. And it's like, and then you can, you can play in that upside. It's like, mm. you know, you can push for the 10 grand job or the 15 grand job because the next highest bid is 25. Yeah. And it's like, you can get paid. And then all that money is, you know, 80% of it is yours rather than 60% is going into the business. 20% is going to pay everyone on the day and 20% goes into the pocket, the owner of the pocket, the pocket of the owner. So yeah. it's like, um, it's, it's an interesting world where it's changing so quickly and the people that are at the forefront of it are really, really capitalizing on it at the moment. So yeah, it's, if you can get in front, like, yeah. you know, there's a wave that you can ride. Where do you think, like, just on the back of that, where do you think video itself is going from a social media slash, you know, corporate, mm. like where, where does, where do you see video going? Do you think it's, it's going to hold that same momentum or? I don't know. I think it's going to hold the same momentum, but I think there's definitely people. There's a there's a need to. I don't know. I don't know. I think I think a lot of people are like, oh, social media. The way that video is done on social vertical is the future. It's like, no, I don't think vertical is the future. No. I don't think. Short, and you see, IGT they yeah. now have caved anyway, so yeah. they're allowing landscape to. Which thank yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Are they actually? Is that yeah? So, so you can just turn your phone and it will just turn with it right so oh, you can perfect so you can upload yeah, an IGTV can update, in just sideways. landscape yeah, yeah, and then yeah. if you want to get it full you know the full viewing experience yeah. you just turn it on your side on your phone it will yeah. go away so it's like so thank, thank, like, yeah. thank god for that i don't Seriously. think i don't think vertical video is the future i don't think short you know 60 second 15 second video is the future do you know I much about tiktok have you seen no a little bit my little sister has got it my little moment? sister's on there i think that i think you need to like for video the future of video you need to pay attention to like both ends of the spectrum it's yeah. like you've got longer form and yeah you've got the creators like um oh what's his name um uh, the pr- director of mind hunter on netflix it's like Scor- no scorsese and those guys who yep. are creating beautiful cinematic pieces for netflix they're not yep. creating videos for warner yeah. brothers or anything like that yeah. they're not creating blockbuster movies they're creating tv shows and movies for netflix yeah but then you've also got creators like me i could shoot something on a rental red like the documentaries that i want to make i'm going to try and sell them to netflix yeah it's like and that means that my videos are in the same space yeah. as someone as you know world-renowned directors and i think that's pretty cool but then you've also got you know yeah 15 second videos tiktok that sort of stuff so i think you need to pay attention to both ends and be like okay people are really innovating over here like yeah if you make a tv show that bores people forget about it you're not gonna succeed at all it's capturing attention yeah exactly it's it's almost probably more about looking at i think i look at it from a consumption point of view attention spans yeah and attention spans are definitely becoming, yeah. and that's why TikTok, I think, is really gaining so much yeah. momentum right now is because attention spans are becoming shorter. So these really Vine-like, mm. it's almost like a reincarnation of Vine, really, in mm. just more of a palatable yeah. social. And I've only just started looking at it over yeah. the last week, literally. <laughs> and so I, I didn't even really know yeah. it exists. I'd heard that it existed, but I didn't yeah. look into it. So I, I, don't think, I don't think that, like... I don't think attention spans are getting shorter. I think our attention for bullshit is getting smaller. Well, I think I that's think that definitely true. People are people can I I say even the dumbest people have, the, they have the have uh, the best BS rate. They can just yeah. see when something's not real. Yeah, it's right? like I think that that's the main thing that's going on here. And I think that like you know something like a oh what was a bloody good movie I watched recently. Well, again, Mindhunter. I bring it back to Mindhunter. Mm. That's a brilliant TV show. It's like that held me for, you know, I barely have enough time to make my own videos, let alone sit and watch a Netflix series. And that held yeah. me for Chernobyl. Chernobyl was brilliant. Those episodes were out. Yet. Oh, man, brilliant. I'm hearing so much about it. Those episodes where, where, were... What, um, who's, who's got it at the moment? Like what network is... Netflix. Oh, Netflix oh no, 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 no. Netflix don't have it. It's, it's HBO. A, so I watched it on oh, Foxtel. On HBO, I watched it on yeah. Foxtel now. Uh, okay. Um, yep. So brilliant. 
Brilliant. Yeah. It was each episode is seventy minutes long, and I was hooked from the entire way through. Yeah. But if you make me a five minute video that's trash, I'm not going to sit through it at all. That's right. No matter yeah. how short it is, like yeah. you could make me a fifteen second Instagram. Isn't that strange, story. right? Because people will binge like Netflix yeah. for like ten hours. Like yeah. they'll watch a whole season and then in not a watch night, a fifteen second. But video. then they'll get bored in a yeah fifteen second video. So I think the main thing is like we're talking about again. We we're talking about this earlier. <laughs> it's like someone like Sorella Moore. It's like her videos are like you know, short and snappy, like five to 10 minutes long. And I can consume them because they're really good. But then I also watch Matt Diavella's videos that go for 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. And I'll sit through the whole thing. It's like, I can sit through it. Got to jump on Max Joseph too. You're going to... Yeah, yeah. It's like, I can sit through those videos. It's like, because I really enjoy every minute of it. Like, he's really paid attention to trying to keep my attention. And he flows his stuff so well. Yeah. Like, there's no parts where you feel like you want to drop out. Yeah. So, I don't think, I don't think it's as much... I think it's definitely more to do with our attention. Our our, our attention to BS has gotten smaller. Yeah. It's like we're not going to give the time of day to BS. I think that there's definitely something about short form video. If you're a business and you're you know someone that's not necessarily caring about entertaining people, yeah. you're trying to get people's attention. Then sure, shorter form video is going to be more successful for you because of the you know you're just gonna catch it's a bigger net to catch more people yeah. but if you're a really talented filmmaker and a really talented creator then go for it make a half an hour video make a three hour movie make a 10 part <laughs> series that's an hour if you're good enough yeah it's like don't worry about making short form content because that's the the way the world's moving it's like i doubt the creators of chernobyl cared about how long each episode went for yeah and they've captivated right. the entire nation it's captivated the entire yeah, the world. world yeah so it's like you know you, i think paying attention to both ends innovation is the main thing it's like, I think innovation. It's like innovation quality right like people will always appreciate quality in mm. the form that it is yeah right exactly and so sometimes things can be too long but maybe mm. maybe only because the quality doesn't match up for its length exactly right? Exactly. So it's an interesting way of putting it because yeah, I've always considered it from a consumption point of view. Like, where is video going? Like, where? How are people consuming it? What are they looking for? Um, rather than looking at like people who are driving that mm. from the other end, which I think you, you, I think you probably do need to look at it from both ends. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and produce your own work with that. Yeah. Tom, it's been like this is actually the before before I go and before I wrap this up. Um, <laughs> This is the first time I've actually recorded this yeah. on like on film. So we've got one of your cameras, one of my cameras film this. We've got like a little mini studio here in this yeah, um, space here. Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, Airbnb. And so I'm, 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 ac- I'm actually really excited to see how this turns out Yeah, and see how it works out. But um, let everyone know if they don't know who you are, you should be following Tom anyway, but let everyone know where can they find you and your work. So it's it's Tom Noski on everywhere. So on everywhere. if you search up Tom Noski, it's everywhere. And my surname TikTok. is just even on TikTok. No, have you got a TikTok? I don't yeah. have a TikTok. So it's just uh, N O S K E. So Tom Noski. So yeah, that's good. yeah, you're where you find all my stuff. So and I post mostly on. Don't go and try and find me on Facebook. I've seen a few of my Instagram followers trying to find me my private Facebook. Please don't do that. It's a little <laughs> bit weird. But my Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube is all Tom Nosky. So you don't have a Facebook page? I have a Facebook page, but I don't use it. Yeah, I kind of forward active. my Instagram post yep. to there to my friends and family that decide okay. to follow it. But no, I don't really use it. There's no, you're not putting any effort there. Not really. Besides, get on the YouTube. Marketing. Yeah, yeah. Get on my YouTube. That's where I need you. <laughs> yeah, he's very close to monetization. <laughs> yeah, I need <laughs> Let's that. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, right. it's been good. Appreciate it, mate. Until next time. We could, we could have actually sp- spoken. I feel like we've already spoken for probably three hours this morning prior we've to been, this. Yeah, we've been hanging out since 7.30 this morning and it's yeah, now it's been, midday. So <laughs> I haven't even had breakfast yet either. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> it's, good. It's, been, it's been good. So. All right. Until next time. Hopefully, it'll be in Melbourne next time. Yeah. So. Perfect. Right. Cheers, mate. See Bye. you later. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Tom. It was a really fun catch up. And if you are new here, please hit that subscribe button. I do have some really cool videos planned and coming. So make sure you hit subscribe and join me on this journey. Uh, I've only just started it. So you can be one of the first, hopefully of many. But if not, I'm going to be making this stuff anyway, because I love creating. So, you know, if you want to join me, please do so. But until next time and the next podcast, I will see you next time.